Thanks for staying with us. It's time to go to the press now and see what the headlines are. Today we'll be looking at Tribune, The Guardian, The Daily Trust and The Punch newspaper uh, this morning. And to discuss that, uh, those headlines with us is Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner here in Lagos. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Kolawole. Good morning, my brother. Thanks for having me. Mm. Good morning. Okay, so we're starting this morning with the Tribune, Nigerian Tribune newspaper, and the leading headline is eventually a headline in all the newspapers. Drama as EFCC Yaya Bello engage in game of wits. The writers are saying ex-governor honored uh, com commission summons left without being interrogated, according to the media aid. He is not in our custody. He remains a wanted man, according to EFCC. Uh, that writer is echoed in the Guardian newspaper that says Belo remains wanted. EFCC insists, lays siege to Kogi government lodge. In uh, the Daily Trust, it also said Yaya yeah, Belo remains wanted, not with us. And then in the Punch newspaper, Yaya yeah, Belo, EFCC besieges Kogi government lodge. That is the story this morning. So uh, I would like to hear from you. His uh, legal team, his media aides are saying that he went to EFCC and then left without him being interrogated. And then the EFCC is saying he's a wanted man. He never, he's not in their custody. They didn't tell us whether he went there and left, but they just said he's not in their custody. Maybe he actually went there and left without being interrogated. And if that's the case, why are they still calling him a wanted man when they had him in their grasp? <laughs> it's really but a laughable matter. Hmm. These are very, very interesting times in Nigeria. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, Nigeria is not really And this uh, cat and mouse game that is going on between Ayabelo and then the EFCC. It's not a define at all. It doesn't all go well for the reputation of uh, EFCC. And neither does it also all go well for the reputation of the Yaya Bilo. And of course, too, the court where his uh, case is before, they also take judicial notice of the case that is going on between the two people. This drama reminds me of what happened when uh, the former governor of Bayesa State, and it was with um, Alamaki, mm. who was uh, wanted in London, in fact, he was under house arrest in London, and somehow he was able to sneak to the airport and then come back to Nigeria, unnoticed by the British and by the British police and all the other security people. Could it be that, uh, with due respect, that Mr. Ayatollah has some mystical power <laughs> with which he could walk to the EFCC's office in Abuja and walk out without being detected or arrested? If he has been going to the EFCC office in Abuja, and also the one in Lagos, there, you want to agree with me that it is difficult for a suspect to go to any of those offices and walk out without being apprehended. They are armed, armed guards, they are placed uh, close to security, I mean, EFCC officials. There are layers and layers of security, CCTV cameras and what are those. But it is very difficult for anybody to go in there and go out. And if it is the without being arrested, except he has a mystical power that is not put to any of us. But with that as a way, like I said before, this. Uh, for this program, I expect from Mr. Ayatollah's uh, uh, case, all these things don't are quite unnecessary, totally unnecessary. Let the Ayatollah exhaust himself. The law doesn't run out. I mean, crime, crime, criminal cases, they are not satisfied. If Mr. Ayatollah is at the end of the other year to come, and he has to see still existing, and Nigeria still exists and what have you, the Ayatollah will still be brought to a uh, justice. The fact that uh, we don't need to over-dramatize this, uh, this uh, issue, uh, the ESCC should stop playing into Yaya Bello's hand and then allow Yaya Bello to ridicule uh, the organization. So, I, I don't know. It, does the EFCC know? 
Uh, does, does the AFCC know that Yaya Bello is in government house? Because if they have besieged the government house, maybe they are suspecting that. One of the things that the media aide said was that he was accompanied to EFCC office uh, by the sitting governor of Kogi State, that is uh, uh, Ododo. The Ododo people have not said anything that is uh, to the contrary. And then if this was what really happened, who, who is now telling lies? Are we saying the media aides and the legal team of Yaya Bello is telling lies or the EFCC is telling lies? Where, where, how can we find out what a lie is, what the lie is in this uh, whole issue? Well, um, I thought the picture that was uh, circulating, uh, which shows that uh, the incumbent governor of Kuki uh, State, Mr. Ototo, Holding hands with Yaya Bello and appears to be working majestically towards the FCC office in Abuja and what have you. Uh, if Mr. Yaya Bello is in uh, the government house in Kogi State uh, with the immunity that is conferred on the uh, government of Ododo, it will not be appropriate for the FCC to storm the government house in Kogi State. And go and appear, Mr. Yaya Bello, in the place. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, all, in my humble opinion, a government house is like an embassy. Uh, they have some kind of immunity uh, usually accorded them, and the respect that usually accorded them. The security men would not want to go in there from the place and then begin to effect arrest because that might be tantamount to trampling. On the subject of immunity of that hallowed uh, gang, and then on the immunity that is conferred on um, Governor Ododo by the Constitution. As the guys we have to know uh, who is actually telling lies and who is not telling lies, like I said, the EFCC facilities have a CCC cancer. The EFCC may want to uh, look at the recording of their CCTV and what I'm doing. And see whether it was able to pick Mr. Naya Bello and Mr. Ododo when they are largely visited the EFCC to be arrested and then uh, interrogated. These things are not too difficult. They are also officials. They are going to be officials of the EFCC. And then, of course, see Mr. Naya Bello has been wanted for a long time. He goes to the EFCC's office. He could be less assured that. Um, some of you people in the press and some other public, some other people in the public and other, who probably would have gotten wind of uh, Mr. Yaya Bello's uh, decision to now surrender himself to EFCC and go and lay siege Yeah, um, uh, Mr. Kolawole, I know there are a lot of other headlines that we need to deal with, but at least I, I need some clarity in this. Um, the immunity given to all the right, governor, right. the immunity given to the governor, uh, I'm digressing a little bit, immunity, yeah. immunity given to governors yeah. and, uh, and presidents, does it cover government house or it covers the individual? Because if a serial killer, for instance, runs into the government house, does the security agency not have the right to go there, drag him out, and make him face the law? Because if that is the case, I don't know why, if at all, Yahya Bello is in government house, that cannot be done. You have used the fact that it's like an embassy or all that, but does it really hold water that if... He's a suspected criminal. He cannot be arrested so long as he's in government house. Well, Mr. Yaya Bello is not a common criminal. He's not an ordinary criminal. Sometimes when they do a supernatural criminal of certain things, what we usually go, I mean, the remedy we usually go to is to look at precedent. Look at what has happened in the past. Look at uh, the way a minor issues like this have always been happening. 
Okay, well, um, I don't know. Maybe we should re review our, our immunity law, the law that gives immunity to governors and all that. Because if, let's say, uh, Ododo stays in office, he gets a second tenure, that is eight years, and then he leaves and gives his stooge also, just like uh, Yaya Bello handed over to him, it will mean that uh, both Yaya Bello and uh, Ododo will stay in government house and nothing can be done about it. And then if it takes like five tenors, then we'll have a government house that should have been turned to prison for, for the criminals and all that. And, and Nigerians are quick to forget. So I don't know, maybe we should revisit our immunity law uh, to make sure that people who are not given immunity, no matter where they are, can be dragged out at any time to prosecute. Well, I, I don't know how that I will agree work. with you absolutely. I agree with you. I agree with you. Mm. It is the immunity clause is being abused. I agree with you. Okay. Um, let's look at other um, headlines now. Um, uh, PDP crisis marking the backs and battle Damagum as governor's National Working Committee plans sack. That's on the Guardian newspaper uh, this morning. So uh, there's this crisis in PDP, I, I hope you know already. And some people are saying that uh, Damagum, uh, one, he's from a geopolitical zone that shouldn't have been uh, given the, uh, the mandate to lead the PDP at this time. It should have been not central, and he's not not central. The other people are also saying that he is a loyalist of um, the FCT minister who has threatened to put fire in uh, the states governed by PDP governors, and uh, which is another case for another day because I don't understand why someone would make 
make an utterance like that and it is not called treason but the person who is fighting on the street to be sure that he gets three square meals is a treasonable of uh, felony um, that they're accusing him of i don't know so this is what is happening so pdp there's crisis and all that i'd like your comment on the crisis on the leadership tussle in pdp and every other thing around it well, the crisis that is happening with PDP, honestly speaking, is uh, a very worrisome one. That crisis has been there for too long. And like I always said, the 2007 election is just around the corner. If the PDP is not able to put his hands in order in the next few months or thereabouts, we must just be having in our hands a one party state. It might just be the APC alone that will be viral enough that is strong enough that will be well organized enough to contest the 2007 election. And if that is the case and not that, then our democracy will suffer from mediocrity and war at home. As regards uh, whether uh, Mr. Tamaku is coming from the zone that should produce a chairman of the, of the PGP or not, well, I think we have to be flexible with regards to that term. Um, a matter. Remember, the party was in crisis when uh, Mr. Jamaku was chosen uh, to engage in a rescue mission to help the party reorganize itself um, so that it could get back in fact um, uh, together. The question will be have you been in office for a few months now? Why is the PDP not interested in organizing its national convention and electing new officers? to represent uh, its uh, interest uh, and war at all. Your guess is as good as mine. When people go to some of these offices and know that, they actually will want to be. Look at what has been playing now, people also in the Labour Party, in which uh, there's the one crisis or the other, with regard to the leadership of that um, uh, organization and war at all. Well, my suspicion is that um, the PDP might be thinking that if they go into any election now to elect the paper officers and northern, they might be causing even very serious, I mean, more serious uh, crisis. Maybe that is the reason why they have been able to do this. I would want to say, and I think to the people in the PDP, so please get their act together, uh, conduct a fresh election, select the paper officers, and then begin to prepare for the 2017 election in the interest of the Nigerian nation. Anything otherwise might be just forced on the Nigerian people a first accomplice, which might be just a one party state, and which there is no alternative to the ruling party that we have empowered to them. Uh, well, God bless Nigeria. Um, Edo polls, <laughs> Edo polls, that's on the punch. Edo polls, INEC deploys 5,000 beavers, 18,000 ad hoc workers. APC, LP tackle PDP over Abaseki's 1 billion naira grant to market women. NAV air lifts are, uh, aircrafts arrive Edo with sensitive materials. Uh, that story is on all the papers that are talking about the due election. It's happening on Saturday. And uh, what would you say about the uh, level of preparation by INEC and the fact that in a Doe state, PDP uh, refused to sign the peace pact? Uh, what impact that will have on the election itself? Well, the peace pact is just uh, a man who will be on the ceremonial thing. It's just a moral thing. There is nothing in the Constitution, there is nothing in, uh, in the Electoral Act or any other law for that matter that says that uh, you must sign a peace pact. And as if you don't have signed the peace pact, there is going to be some dire consequences. It's just a moral thing to encourage leaders to be accountable to the people. And um, this moral thing is being managed uh, by eminent uh, Nigerian citizens. Uh, former head of state and all that, that people should utterly respect. Whoever wants a free and fair election, utterly should submit himself to the peace pact. And the abuses that the general Salam and Muhammad Council, the people, are telling to put the petition. Uh, it should be encouraged. As regards the uh, bias and uh, some of these other materials and war happened, I want to say a very strong way that more than 300,000 PDC have not been collected by registered voters uh, in the state. As Senator Tony, 
made an admission to that uh, refusal to collect the PVC. But that more than 300,000 PVC is enough to decide who wins the adult state election and who loses it. So these are fundamental issues. For issues like violence and war and peace, I'm not too sure that we don't happen at the last election that uh, any Nigerian politicians or any Nigerian political party or even the voters themselves will be placing any serious reliance on the Bible for the outcome of these uh, elections and all that. We should just appeal to the different political parties to play the game the way it should be played and for the electorate in uh, Edo State to be vigilant, let them uh, be the security for their own vote. You don't leave the police station to the polls are counted, recorded, and then unknown before you go back to your respective uh, homes. If they are able to provide security for their own vote and all that, the problem will not need all these bypass and some of these other layers and layers of security that is um, uh, that has been deployed in Edo State. With regard to the money that um, Governor Obataki has given to the market women, well, Except we are able to prove that it's being used to, co to compromise the integrity of the election, there's hardly anything can, any, anybody can do about that. But we must remember that most times it is these market women and the ordinary people on the street who wake up in the morning and go to the respective polling uh, booths to vote. The educated people most times uh, as they perform their civic responsibility, civic responsibility when it comes to vote. So it may be a very subtle incentive for this market women and men to go out and vote. I remember so Mr. Vasaki has been mobilizing the civil servants in the Dote and telling them that if they don't vote for his candidate, all the gains that have been recorded, all the things that they have done for them within the last eight years, are going to be reversed that the APC if they win that election. So, uh, also remember that uh, providing inducements, any form of compromising the voters or the security people, is a kind of crime under the Electoral Act, the Constitution, and then the Criminal Code of, uh, of the Federation. If it is shown that the money that the incumbent government is supposed to pay is to compromise the integrity of the election, of course, himself and his candidate without a case to answer at the appropriate time. Okay, just... Uh, every... And all this thing will become an issue before the different election petition tribunal that is set up with regard to this election that we conducted in Edo State today. Mm. Let's just be very brief. I have two, uh, two or three uh, other headlines now to just say in the small time that we okay. have. Private employers paying below 70,000 risk jail. That's according to federal government. Uh, that's what they're saying about minimum wage. And they're threatening uh, private employers paying below 70,000 and that they are going to risk jail. I don't know what you have to say about that. Minimum wage, even some states have refused to pay uh, more than the 30,000 Naira that they've been talking about since. Or some people have not even paid 30,000 Naira minimum wage uh, from the stories that we hear. And now federal government is threatening the private sector. Even when the they promise of uh, 70,000 in all the states have not been implemented, but the private sector are the ones that will start going to jail for this. I don't know what your take is on this. <laughs> mm. When you look at uh, the minimum wage uh, uh, law and what I do, ordinarily the federal government should, should not even be making law for the state with respect to how much we they should say and what they should not uh, say. Uh, because uh, if you are running the federation, all these things should be left to the discretion of the respective states and what have you. Because the resources that is available to the respective states and the federal government are not the same. The sources are also different from state to state. Say, for example, a state like Bayelsa, we don't have local government, you probably get more money than the state like uh, your state, which has a uh, uh, sense of a uh, of local government. And then, like you have rightly observed, there is also a guideline as regards who should pay the minimum wage. Usually it will be said that uh, if an employer employs more than this certain number of employees, 
then such an employer is strong enough to pay the minimum wage. If you employ just one or two persons, and then you don't have the resources, I'm not too sure that the law has said you should pay the minimum wage, no matter what you said that the federal government uh, might be making. Mm. And again, do remember, I'm not too sure that even the, whether the federal government itself has begun to pay this uh, minimum wage across board in the MDA, in the federal civil service, and the different agencies that uh, people have uh, all over the place. Then we should also remember the implication of making this a criminal offense uh, for the uh, private employers of labor in the country. Mm -hmm. The federal government should be flexible with regards to this uh, payment of minimum wage uh, uh, pay. Mm, well. Okay, uh, let's let's take uh, uh, another headline here, and this time, uh, yes, uh, Tinubu may merge, merge uh, MDA's scrap humanitarian ministry. Uh, maybe the Arusanya report finally will be implemented in this. Uh, they are saying that he might just scrap uh, humanitarian ministry, and then he may merge MDA's. Uh, for the person who was saying that it's going to cut costs and then the, the, a lot of things will be reduced and ministries will be merged, now they're talking about him merging some, M may merge some MDAs and scrap a humanitarian ministry of all ministries. I would think that, I thought they have started that. Uh, remember there was a time this issue also came up uh, on your program. And which was if the Secretary of Government or whoever was said to have written certain letters to certain ministers and parasatas mm. and MD with regard to the functioning of those organizations in line with the Rotary report uh, that was the name so many years um, ago. And we had actually at that period in time that um, with the kind of massive unemployment that we have in our hands and then the hunger in the land. This might not be the appropriate time for the federal government to begin to mark uh, its institutions and agencies and then uh, getting people uh, off, so bring people uh, off. The problems of unemployment and hunger in the land is just too much that the federal government should, uh, as much as possible, refrain from engaging in such uh, uh, programs and projects uh, all over the, the federation. But, there is no doubt that to certain agencies have at least their usefulness. They are not performing any useful function. They are just mere drainage pipes. But the occasion, the circumstances, and the environment of Nigeria today is not up for way for the rationalization of labor in any of the federal government, state agencies, or even the local government for that matter. Today, with 33, 35 unemployment in Nigeria and hunger in the land, what we should be doing is creating more jobs. We could encourage people to retire early but not to begin to rationalize and match institutions which will eventually be to throw people out of their employment and earning a vision for themselves uh, all over Nigeria. For every employer of the state government or federal government that is pay off, five other people might suffer the consequences, either as their children, dependents or relations, and then copies, of course, would have to be paid to the different schools. The school fees are also going up. Well, that's the little contribution I want to make with respect to that. Okay. Time is not suspicious for the federal government to start marching and then uh, refusing the MCA or any of the federal government. Uh, if we should remember, too, a government that they want to start rationalizing the institution uh, not too long ago created a ministry of uh, I mean, for life talk. Yeah. If and then uh, a minister appointed to that effect. These are, these are contradictions in time. We don't begin to rationalize our mass ministries and also begin to create uh, more ministries in the same place. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, the on my soul. Okay, well, we've run out of time, and there are so many other headlines here, but we hope that uh, the people watching us right now will grab copies of these uh, newspapers for themselves or go to online and read some of these stories for themselves and see what is happening in our country. We'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, for coming on the program this morning. Thanks for having me. Wish you a lovely day. You too. It's always a pleasure having you.
We've been talking with Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner, and we were looking at the headlines that made it to the front pages of our national dailies. We couldn't even exhaust all of them. And like I said, I encourage you to get uh, some papers for, your, for yourself and read up on what is going on in our country. You can do that by going to a newspaper stand. You can do that by going online. You, there are so many avenues to be able to read what is happening. Stay informed so that you can also know what to contribute to make our country grow bigger. We'll take a short break and when we return we'll take our first hot topic uh, stay with us <laughs> 